All right, I'm going to get started a little bit. Um, sure. We're going to be <coughs> talking about recursion, no doubt, today, and infinite regress and multiple levels of embedding. So we have a problem here, which is uh, Raphael has to introduce me, and I have to introduce him, and we we have to break the protocol or something like that. So I will break the protocol. I will go first. Um, probably most people know who I am, and if not, maybe you'll find it out later. Um, I will introduce my co-conspirator in all of this and give you a little background context, which is I wrote some thread on Twitter and, or, or no, I guess I wrote an article uh, about deep learning hitting a wall, and Raphael wrote the first, uh, let's say, detailed, thoughtful reply. Um, there were a lot of people making fun of my title about deep learning is hitting a wall, making all kinds of fun cartoons about Godzilla crushing walls and so forth. And Raphael came up with constructive criticism. And I love that. And we started writing back and forth about Twitter and compositionality. And next thing you know, here we are. So Raphael is a presidential scholar in society and neuroscience and lecturer in philosophy at Columbia University. He did his PhD at University of Oxford in philosophy. And his current research, he tells me, he seeks to gain a better understanding of the capacities of deep learning models and establish fair and meaningful comparisons with human cognition, which sounds to me like an awfully good thing to do. Um, I'm glad to have him here as my co-conspirator today. Thanks, Gary. So uh, do you want to say a few words about the, the uh, general workshop before I introduce you for your talk, or, or do you want to go? Uh, right well, away? so my, my talk is going to be a, a hybrid, because I like hybrids, between introducing the general themes of the conference and giving my own opinion, um, which I can't help myself doing. So I'll sort of throw it all in there, I guess, but you can say anything you'd like. All right, so I'll, 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 I'll introduce you. Um, so you probably uh, already are familiar with Gary, but Gary Marcus is a scientist, best-selling author and entrepreneur. He was founder and CEO of Geometric Intelligence, a machine learning company acquired by Uber in 2016. And his most recent book co-authored with Ernest Davis, Rebooting AI, is one of Forbes seven must-read books in AI. So Gary, take it away. All right. So. Um, my, my title slide is, is both the title of the conference and, and also to indicate vaguely what it is that I'm going to be talking about right now. <laughs> and I thought it would be appropriate if I said what compositionality is. Of course, the lesson of 20th century uh, philosophy of language is we can't define anything. And I'm not going to try to give you an absolute precise definition of compositionality. Uh, but whoops. Um, I, I'll give you this from Zoltan Sabo, who has, I think, one of the, or Zoltan Gendler Sabo, who has one of the kind of standard references now about uh, the case for compositionality. A standard theory neutral way to state the principle of compositionality is as follows. The meaning of a complex expression is a function of the meaning of its constituents and the ways they are combined. I think that's probably good enough for most of our discussion. There's lots of questions that will open up from there, but I think that's roughly what we mean. And a kind of standard uh, playing out of that would be something like you have a sentence, let's say the cat is on the mat, um, which GPT-3 did in an impression of me, you can find on Twitter, uh, attributing that sentence to me. Um, the cat is on the mat, specifies a meaning in terms of the relationship on between some entities, the cat and the mat. And then part of the point is, of course, you could reverse that. So you could say the mat is on the cat, which would be a little bit less common. It would specify a different meaning. And the entities in that case would be the same, but the relationship between the entities would be reversed. Compositionality is basically about that, being able to tell the difference between the cat is on the mat and the mat is on the cat, that these have different meanings as a function of how their parts are put together. Maybe put it in a slogan, the syntax is guiding the semantics. Part of the goal of language comprehension would be to recover those relationships. So if I hear the cat is on the mat, I wanna have a mental model of some cat and some mat and some relation between them. Um, part of the goal of language production would be to go the other way around to take an intent maybe specified in terms of relations between entities that you want to express in order to produce a structured string that represents that intent. And I would argue, or many people have argued, not just me, um, that similar abilities are important for vision, for music, for math, and so forth. I'm going to focus on language in my remarks. That doesn't mean that other people um, need strictly to focus on language, but I think we'll mostly be talking about language here. Certainly people can ask questions about that at any time. And then I think our first main question before us is, is compositionality optional? So I think large language models raise the specter that it might be. They don't directly imp implement compositionality at all. Um, and I would argue at their peril that they don't, and I'm sure we'll have lots of discussion around that. Um, I would say that if you have a classic semantic parser, that what you do is you map a string into meanings, intents, and so forth. 
Um, but the, what large language models do is typically simply to predict the next word uh, in, in a sequence and that that's really not the same thing. And we can have discussion about that. I would argue those predictions are correlated with traditional meanings, correlated with them, um, but they're a proxy and only loosely correlated with them. They're not meanings. There is no decomposition of a sentence, for example, into entities and relationships between those entities, at least not in a way that's accessible to us. And there's no accessible database that's directly updated as a consequence. And I would argue that there are some serious costs for trying to live without compositionality. So one thing that I think is at stake is having a dynamically updated world model. So in a classical framework, let's say Shurglu, which was Terry Winograd's, uh, I guess, dissertation work in the 70s, um, and he, of course, uh, um, had the students page uh, in Brin that you might be familiar with some of their work on, on search. Um, uh, they, uh, in his system, there was a set of objects in a world that was rendered on a CRT screen, originally black and white, but it was intended to color. Um, and eventually that was done. And you could ask it really subtle questions that involve um, complex compositionality. Um, my, I'm blocking the screen and I won't be able to do this one from memory. Okay, does the shortest thing the tallest pyramid support supports support anything green, which is a pretty hard to parse, but the point is the system could then say, yes, the green uh, pyramid and then um, even do pronoun resolution and so forth. Not saying it's a perfect system and we could talk about that, um, but it's impressive in, in what it could do. Uh, um, and it's interesting to compare it with, let's say, Gato. Um, I bet Gato can't do Black's world. I made that bet public in a sort of sly way in May. Um, I would guess that Gato, which is probably the state of the art in a large language model that can integrate perception, I don't think can, can keep track of blocks and um, movements of blocks and so forth over time. I did ask DeepMind on May 13. <coughs> and said it would be really cool if you could put a robot arm, which it can also control together with uh, Blocks World, sorry, I guess it was 68. Um, it'd be really interesting to do that. Um, of course, I didn't hear back from them, but maybe I will yet. Um, I think it would probably pose some problems for Gato. So GPT and systems like this in general lose context over time, they get lost in discourse. And Shirtaloo is really about maintaining a representation of a world as it has changed in different uh, ways. We can't directly assess meaning in a large language model as such um, per se, but you can do indirect proxying things. Here's an example from my longtime collaborator, Ernie Davis, that's sort of a little bit sure to like um, for a paper that I just, or an essay I just did with Elliot Paul. John pulled out, a, uh, a, pulled out of a bag, a blue vase, a red apple, a yellow banana, a black pen, a red rose, and a green cucumber. What's the second red item he pulled out? We need to have a representation of a sequence of actions in order to realize that the second red item that was pulled out was a red rose and, and GPT-3 can't do it. GPT-3 can't do it. I'm wondering whether Gato is really gonna be able to do this stuff and the, the silence thus far um, makes me suspicious. Okay, so that's, that's one. Second thing that is at stake is I would say controllability. So pure prediction, predicting the next word in a sequence based on some vast database is hard to control. When you have this kind of holistic prediction that's common in large language models without interpretable meanings, without database updates, you get fantastic broad linguistic coverage that the symbolic world has not been able to meet. But it's also hard to ground those systems ethically. You have lots of problems with bias and stereotyping, counseling harm. It's really hard to ground them in truth. And so they fabricate all kinds of information. Nobody knows how to control this. It's hard to maintain coherence over the long term. So you wind up with a toxic spew of harmful advice and misinformation. Um, well summarized in this recent review by DeepMind, which uh, just became a paper at fact. Compositionality, on the other hand, is not mysterious. Programming languages assume it, for example. So does math. The semantics of a Python program is determined by the parts in which the, in the ways in which those parts are put together. It's not that we don't know how to build compositionality. We do. What is mysterious is the precise nature of compositionality in human language, which I'll come back to, and the proper role and implementation of compositionality in AI. And my title here is an allusion in a way to Paul Smolensky's title of a paper that we first discussed when we first met in 1993, which is an allusion itself to a title um, from Montague about semantics. So uh, thanks for being here, Paul. And that's uh, first homage to you. Um, so three options going forward. We could build all of our AI on a simple manipulation framework in which compositionality is explicit and well understood. There's lots of virtues in terms or potential virtues in terms of verifiability, interpretability, um, but simple systems are all, 
you know, mostly typically largely hand wired. They're often brittle. They're not entirely satisfactory. Most people don't want to fully go down that um, symbol manipulation road again, having tried it and not really succeeded before. We could ignore the issue of compositionality and hope for the best, hope that with enough data, things will sort themselves out, that large language models will produce strings that reflect the grammar of human language somehow, or sorry, I mean, they do do that. They do produce the strings. Maybe somehow we'll magically solve these problems about lack of interpretability and um, get the meanings we want out of them. We can hope for that. Um, or we can try to find ways of incorporating compositionality into neural networks. That's, I think, really what Paul has been trying to do. And it's also in part what my 2001 book was about. Um, and I'll allude to mine and Paul will give his own talk on his shortly. Um, a, a brief exegesis, uh, a brief discussion um, about Dali. I'm, I'll be very critical of compositionality in Dali. The reason I'm picking on it is because because it makes pictures, you can kind of see what its meaning is, so to speak. And it, I can do this to give examples of what a good compositionality system might do and, and the kind of gap we need to solve. So um, red cube on top of blue cube, Dolly doesn't really know which thing is the red cube or the blue cube. It just has features, redness, blueness, cubeness, maybe topness, um, but it's not putting them all together. That's a failure of compositionality in my view. Um, or <clears throat> on the right, a red basketball with flowers on it in front of a blue one with a similar pattern. The system doesn't really understand what similar pattern is. Um, you can go through in detail. Most of these um, are, are wrong. Um, Horse Rides Astronaut is an essay I just wrote on Substack. You can look it up. Um, and it's mocking the, everybody was excited about Astronaut Rides Horse. Dolly does a great job of it. But it has a lot of trouble doing um, Horse Rides Astronaut. It's not actually impossible. We can talk about that or you can read my essay. Um, but the two I show at the top have different linguistic trees, and that's really the point. Astronaut rides horse and horse rides astronaut, and the system should give you a different semantic interpretation of them, and it doesn't. Um, uh, Elliot Murphy, and in a paper with uh, Evelina Levada um, that we're all working on together, or about to work on together, <clears throat> has many, many more examples. Right now, you can see them in our, our Substack essay from a couple of days ago, Three Ideas from Linguistics that Everyone AI Should Know. Um, there are examples like the bowl has fewer tomatoes than cucumbers. And again, you get this kind of non-compositional reading um, from the system or interpretation from the system where it knows there are bowls and tomatoes. Sometimes it forgets the bowls. Sometimes it forgets um, the cucumbers. It's just not putting it together compositionally to extract uh, the full meaning from its parts. Like that's um, illustrating both the failures and trying to set the bar for what it is that a compositional system would do. Okay, now, important question. Does this mean neural networks are incompatible with compositionality? My answer to that is a resounding no. It just means some neural networks, like DALI2, are incompatible. And I wonder about GPT-3, and, and I think there will be a lot of discussion about that here. Um, <coughs> we know minimally that any symbol manipulating system, um, and we know symbol manipulating systems can implement compositionality, can be realized in many different ways, including in different kinds of neural networks, not transformers per se, but for example, Siegelman, I might've misspelled her name, I'm sorry. Um, and Sontag showed how you could build a Turing machine with a tape and all this kind of stuff. So you could build your compositionality on the Turing tape and build that on a network of nodes. So it's not that they're logically incompatible. The real question is, if we're going to build AI out of neural networks, must we build a neural network that simply implements compositionality one for one without adding anything or telling us anything new, but maybe still being important? Um, in a way that maps one-to-one -one onto a classical symbol system, or might a successful neural network <coughs> offer some kind of alternative, and what kind of alternative? And that's what Paul and I have been talking about for 29 years, I guess, um, and he will uh, try to address uh, in a little bit. Um, and then a sub-question might be, might compositionality <coughs> be something that is learned rather than something inherent? So compositionality is innate, let's say, in the design of LISP, is how LISP is built, um, and I have always argued that compositionality is one of the things we need to start with. Jan LeCun wrote an interesting essay directed at me a couple of weeks ago with Jake Browning arguing, yeah, you do <coughs> need simple manipulation, but it, it's learned. And of course, that's possible. Um, it has not been disproven. I am skeptical. We could talk about why, um, but it's certainly an, an open question that can be considered. Um, here's what I think are the minimal requirements for compositionality. Stable encodings of individual elements an operation that concatenates pieces of trees together or disassembles holes into their parts, iterative processes for constructing or deconstructing larger structures, and representational formats for trees or something that's a lot like 
trees. So for example, you should get a different tree for horse rides astronaut from Dolly Dreams, astronaut rides horse. So I didn't make that perfectly get the idea. Um, and then you probably also need some other machinery that for example, Pinker has emphasized, a lot of linguists have emphasized, um, linking mechanisms that derive the semantics relative to this syntactic representation. Okay. Um, I would just mention briefly that the thing Hinton's trying to do right now is actually really relevant. Blom, which I think is an interesting paper, although as he says in the first sentence of it, it doesn't describe a working system, but his aspiration is really a system that has stable encodings that could be uh, represented in complex whole. So it's interesting to sort of compare his approach and how I was thinking about it uh, in the algebraic mind and what Paul has to say and so forth. Um, composition, a couple more important points and then I, I'm gonna turn things over. Um, uh, compositionality is, is not sufficient. It's part of a framework. So often when I talk about AI, people are looking to me for a magic bullet. I do not think I will ever give you or anyone will ever give you a magic bullet. There are a lot of problems that we need to solve in AI. I think compositionality, in my view, is one of the most important, um, but it's not the whole thing. So you have syntax goes to semantics and compositionality plays a role in there. And ultimately that has to go to cognitive models. Our best guess at external reality or if we're watching a movie or reading a novel, then we're building a cognitive model of, of some fictional world. Um, it's just the start to have compositionality to get you to that world that you can reason over. And let's not forget that and think that the minute we solve compositionality, we're done. Um, we use language to accumulate knowledge. So for example, um, my kids asked uh, a couple of days ago to my wife, I wasn't there, but something like, is junk food more expensive than regular food? So they use a complicated sentence in order to recover some fact about the world. Do people make junk food or does it grow um, and so forth? Um, so, you know, we use language in service of accumulating knowledge. So the real challenge is to build language understanding systems that can update their understanding of the world by decomposing meanings in, in terms of their parts taken in context of speaker intent, or at least that's how I think it about all of this. I'm old fashioned. Maybe somebody here will persuade me there's a different way to do all of this. A um, few words about humans, and then I think I'm on my conclusion slide. Um, humans are interesting. We clearly understand wholes in terms of their parts, but there are also some deviations from ideal. Um, and this is part of what Paul and I have been talking about all these years. So machines allow arbitrary embedding, but humans, for example, have trouble with center embedding. So nobody in this room, unless they've seen this before, is going to easily parse a man that a woman that a child that a bird that I heard saw knows loves. But theoretically, it's, it's well parsed, and Tal will straighten us out in the linguistics if I have butchered it. My view is that uh, variable binding is expensive in humans. And we use a Q-dependent substitute that's vulnerable to interference. So we approximate um, full compositional representation, but we don't quite get it right. And I wrote about that in my book, Kluge. Um, humans allow also, importantly, allow an immense number of frozen forms and idioms that are not internally compositional. So when I say somebody kicked the bucket, there's probably no bucket and probably no kicking. I'm probably telling you that somebody died. If I talk, talk about a street that's a dead end, it's not literally dead. Um, so idioms are part of what makes natural language understanding hard. You don't understand kick the bucket by forming comp compositional representation of its internal parts of someone sending a projective force towards a pail. You might take the larger part, kick the bucket meaning died and now put it together with the name of somebody. Um, let's say the former guy kicked the bucket and then you can uh, 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 put all, that all together. Um, a good natural language understanding system probably has to blend two pathways. And this is where I think things actually get interesting. Um, there's a pure semantics from syntax, which would work for tipped over the pail. Um, and then there's this idiomatic retrieval, kick the bucket equals died. A single sentence can easily combine both. The person who tipped over the pail on Tuesday suddenly and unexpectedly kicked the bucket on Wednesday. And we can make sense of that. Um, getting all of this right, in my view, cries out for machine learning and, and classical natural language understanding to work together, to find some way where you can do the kind of pure compositional stuff in all the ways that we've always imagined with a lot of machine learning about all these exceptions and, and so forth. So conclusion slide, it's, it's a long slide, but then I promise I am done. <coughs> Compositionality in language is about systematically inferring or generating a meaning from its parts in a structure dependent way. It flows naturally in symbolic paradigms like programming language like Python. It does not naturally and automatically emerge from very large data, as we saw with Dolly. You need some kind of in, innate architectural underpinning. And the truth is, even if compositionality per se is not innate, something has to be innate such that you can acquire compositionality. Something has to be different from what Dolly does, and that has to be innate. 
you know, whether it looks exactly like compositionality, that's open. Um, no fully adequate solution exists. I would say, you know, there's confusion in linguistics about what compositionality is. AI field doesn't really know what to do with it. We know handwriting all rules of language is difficult. There is this large, I would call it idiomatic periphery, all this stuff of idioms that machine learning ought to be able to help with. Current machine learning approaches though tend to focus on feature-wise correlation, which is not really what I want. We need robust machine learning that can work at scale over higher levels of abstraction, lots of work to be done there. And hence good reason for neurosymbolic rapprochement between symbolic and statistical approaches. And let's not forget compositionality ultimately is in the service of something larger, a dynamically updated set of cognitive models of the world. Capturing that workflow is vital if we're gonna build systems that we can trust. I thank you very much. I will take a deep breath. And then I believe Allison is next. And I will stop sharing. I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, and is Allison here? She is indeed. So um, a few words on, on Allison. Um, actually, I have one word for Allison. I, I misplaced her bio. She's at the University of Chicago, but too many things are flowing around. But my one word for Allison is no or not. Um, she wrote a really beautiful paper about how hard it is for um, BERT, which was one of the first kind of large language models to understand the simple word not. It was beautiful, elegant um, study. And, and I look forward to where she's gone since then. Uh, thank you for joining us, Allison. Thank you, Gary. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and do the screen share. Let's uh, get this over here. Are you seeing mm -hmm. the slides? We're good. Perfect. All right. Great, yeah, it is uh, lovely to be part of this very interesting conversation with all these uh, awesome folks. I am going to be covering some of the, some, some uh, ground that aligns with what Gary was just talking about in what I'm going over here. I'm gonna start with sort of a high level characterization of, of the problem and um, then move to sort of breaking this down into some different angles in terms of what we need to capture with, with the compositionality in natural language understanding. Um, uh, what we need to also be able to uh, evaluate in terms of angles on compositionality in NLU, as well as different uh, sort of parts of this problem that folks have been tackling, how I sort of think about how this work. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about challenges that we ourselves in our group have been tackling um, within this space. So title of this panel, why compositionality matters for AI. And Thinking about this, what I tend to focus on is the nature of the human language understanding capacity and specifically the fact that, for instance, I can give you a sentence like this one, the magenta tiger recited the ballad but did not forgive the vice principal. This is a very nonsensical, unlikely sentence. It's one that you presumably have never heard before. And nonetheless, you are, if you are a speaker of English, able to effortlessly extract the meaning of this sentence. And the reason that you are able to do this is because language has the property of compositionality such that the meaning of the whole can be derived on the basis of the meanings of parts. If we want models, to be able to understand language. It's very clear humans are doing this, are able to do this. If we want models to be able to understand language, it's going to be critical for them to be able to handle this type of compositionality because the alternative is for models to be memorizing the meanings of infinite phrases and sentences, which clearly is not going to be feasible. So in terms of talking about why compositionality is critical, the way that I tend to characterize this is that compositionality quite simply stands as the critical alternative to infinite memorization in language. Now, having said that, I wanna cover a couple of obvious things. First of all, it's very clear and not controversial that memorization is also a critical part of human language understanding. Things like word meanings, things like idiomatic phrase meanings, all are going to require memorization. So at no point am I trying to claim that memorization, it's not going to be something that has a role in NLU, but something that is equally obvious is what we've just illustrated. And that's the fact that humans can understand phrases and sentences that are novel, strange, improbable, and nonsensical. And we critically need to rely on the notion of compositionality in order to instill this capacity in models. Now, let's go ahead and refine our goals a bit here because the default definition of compositionality that we all know that Gary has mentioned, um, that the meaning of the whole is gonna be a function of the meaning of the parts, while accurate and critical is going to be trivially satisfied by basically all of the models that we use at this point. And it's just not terribly helpful in terms of solving natural language understanding. Case in point, the fact that a bag of words averaging model is a compositional model, but it's very clear that a model like this is not going to be able to capture critical nuances of meaning. For instance, the fact that there are sentences that have identical word content, but critically different meanings. This is not something these models are gonna be able to handle. <clears throat> 
So in terms of what we actually need when we're talking about compositionality, it's not that default definition. What we really need is accurate and human-like extraction of compositional meanings from language inputs. We need to critically rely on humans. There's just no other way of defining what, it, what a composite, an accurate compositional meaning is. So we're gonna use that as our, our uh, ground truth. So I'm gonna get increasingly specific about what I mean by this to illustrate at a high level what I mean. What we're talking about here is mimicking the human capacity to take a silly sentence like this one, three singing rabbits walked into the local bar last Wednesday afternoon and be able to extract all of the rich information that a human is able to get out of this. The fact that there are three rabbits, they walk into a bar, this happened on a Wednesday, they were singing, it happened in the afternoon and all of the various nuances of the features and, and implications of this new information. So now I'm going to go ahead and start breaking down some aspects of what the, this human, accurate human-like compositionality needs to be able to capture and angles on this that folks, including folks here, have been critically tackling in really interesting and important ways. So I'm gonna do two different distinctions uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll go over in turn. The first is what I think of as syntactic angles on composition. And the second is what I tend to refer to as more semantic angles on composition. And then the second distinction that I'm gonna go over is what I refer to as supervised angles on composition versus what we might think of as pre-trained NLU angles on composition. And I'll explain each of these in turn, give some examples. So in terms of syntactic versus semantic angles, when, when I refer to syntactic angles, what I'm thinking about specifically is the ability to, to bind components of a sentence to uh, their correct roles. So things like SRL, filler role binding, semantic parsing, tasks like this. The example that I just gave here, I would put in this category, the fact that models need to be able to identify the fact that waitress and cu customers are different roles in the different sentences here. In our rabbit example, we're talking about things like identifying that the rabbits are the agents of walking, the bar is the location or destination of the walking, the singing is a modifier of rabbits, and so on, in terms of binding these to their roles. When I talk about more semantic angles on composition, what I'm thinking about is beyond having identified the roles of these, of, of these items and the order in which they need to be composed, to what extent are we capturing the actual correct features of composed phrases and sentences, as well as the implications of those meanings for a given task? So for instance, to what extent can we, like humans, take the meaning of a word like old and the meaning of a word like cat and produce an output that captures all of the nuances of the features of the phrase old cat that humans understand, instead of any number of alternative things that may combine features of those words and produce an incorrect output in terms of the actual features of its meaning? Thinking about semantic angles also critically addresses problems of sense selection and sense variation. So if we were to swap the roles of things here, obviously now the bars are doing the walking, the rabbit is the, re the recipient or target of the walking, but there are a lot of other nuances of what's going on here. For instance, the phrase singing bars might refer to bars that are singing, but may more likely refer to bars where people do the act of singing. Walking into a rabbit, Strange again, possible we have a giant rabbit that can be entered, but instead it's probably more likely when you're walking into a rabbit that you're walking and slamming into a rabbit instead. There are a ton of nuances in terms of the meanings that come out of this compositional process. They are predictably derivable on the base basis of which things are combining. These are all things that humans are able to do and that we need models to be able to do. Finally, in this semantic angles category, I also count the ability to use meanings and deploy them for the sake of a given task. So for instance, in a language modeling task, an obvious one that we use a lot, we need to be able to encode this new information that Sebastian lives in France, that there is an entity Sebastian, Sebastian lives in France. And then what are the implications of this information when we are now called to make a prediction here? So that's the syntactic versus semantic angles breakdown. I'm gonna go now to this second distinction before I move on to talking a little bit about where we have fallen in the space and how we've been tackling problems. When I talk about supervised angles here, a lot of folks on this very panel have been doing wonderful work in this area. Uh, where the basic idea here is you define a supervised task setting and test whether trained models in this supervised task show what's been referred to frequently as compositional generalization. The question of focus here tends to be, can and do current neural models learn these supervised tasks so that, such that they generalize compositionally at test time? And the clear advantage, a wonderful advantage of this is that you have full knowledge of everything the model saw in training and exactly how the test items relate to those or force generalization beyond those. So this 
allows us to ask focused questions about particular tasks, models, and data sets um, in what tend to be fairly synthetic settings. It is not necessary that these be tied to naturalistic NLU per se. We tend to be asking more of a theoretical question about these particular, whether these models are able to compositionally generalize in these settings. Um, they tend to be a little more synthetic and less naturalistic, but can, can be tied in and can be more NLU focused. I mentioned that because I'm going to specifically contrast that area of work from what I refer to as more pre-trained NLU angles on compositionality. Obviously, the dramatic progress we've seen in recent years has been driven by uh, pre-trained language models, pre-trained models in general. So it, this raises this critical question of whether these successes that we're seeing reflect learning of effective compositional meaning extraction during this type of pre-training. Uh, Gary has, has very coherently argued, no, probably not, but it, we do see really compelling uh, outputs from these models. And so it, it repeatedly, every time a new model comes out, raises the question, did we solve it? Did these models manage, uh, even though all they're doing is predicting words in context, did they manage, did they manage it? So this is an important question that I'm, I'm spending more time in this because this is the area that I'm going to focus on. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing in this area. The advantage of this area is that it allows us to tackle these critical compositionality questions about the models that are widely in use by the community within their naturalistic settings. But the clear challenge here is that we no longer have full control of the, the content of the training data knowledge with respect to exactly what was there. So it's difficult to say, all right, well, how do we tell whether compositional, compositionality is happening as opposed to more, something more along the lines of memorization? So since this is the area that we've been tackling, I'm gonna now transition to talking a little bit about how we've worked on tackling this, and then I will uh, summarize and wrap up. So the question that we ask in our work is, how do we address this difficult problem of testing for effective compositionality in these types of models when we don't have control over the training data? How do we approach this? The way we do that is the following. We start by defining some type of information that should be represented or behaviors that should be produced if effective compositional meaning is being captured. And then, Quite critically, we hypothesize and control for potential heuristic and, heuristics and confounds that might be used by these models and might give the illusion of success in compositional meaning extraction without actually having succeeded with proper compositional meaning. We have three concrete examples of these. I'm going to go over them briefly because there's not a lot of time, but I encourage you to take a look at these uh, or, or ping me about these papers if you're interested and unfamiliar with them. So, First example, this is not actually pre-trained LMs, this predates pre-trained LMs, but what I wanna to try to illustrate here is that we see a very similar pattern across, across time and across models um, when we introduce uh, appropriate controls. So the problem in this work was basically our pre-trained sentence encoders from a few years ago, systematically capturing semantic role information. So this is in, a little bit on the syntactic side, I'm gonna to move to the semantic side in a moment. All we did here was design classification probes for semantic role information encoded in sentence embeddings. But in addition to simply designing these binary classification tasks, we control for a critical confound, which is that of general statistics, because it's very possible that you may see high classification performance in these probes simply because these embeddings are sensitive to general statistics of how words tend to combine rather than uh, a systematic understanding of the actual current sentence. For instance, in this case, you can imagine that if your test data has high, greater representation of the waitress served the customer, the more common order here, then you're going to end up seeing high classification performance just by merit of the fact that these models are sensitive to what, how these words tend to combine and not how they're combining in this actual sentence. So in order to control this, we introduce a bag of words control, which just says our data needs to be controlled such that these bag of words averaging models will be strictly a chance for anything that requires access to word order. And sure enough, when we do this, we see that bag of words models are a chance on everything but word content. So these are a series of sequential models. And basically what we're seeing here is that for word content and word order, the models show very high classification performance. But when we have properly controlled our data, we see no particular sign of semantic role being captured in these sentence encoders. So of course, we're not talking about sentence encoders anymore. We're working on pre-trained language models at this point in the field. So examples from this area, if we look at phrasal meaning in transformer language models, this is now more along this space of trying to see whether two word phrases show the features of, uh, of meanings that we need them to. So we're asking whether transformer language model representations capture these nuances of phrase meaning. What we do is we extract model representations, compare them against human judgments through very simple metrics, similarity correlations, paraphrase correlation, paraphrase classification. 
But once again, we might expect that we will see high correlations or high paraphrase classification accuracy if just because the models have sensitivity to word overlap if this is not controlled. So we introduce a word overlap control such that the amount of word overlap is no longer a cue for similarity or paraphrase status. For instance, here are, is our original data set without controlling word overlap. Here is the ABBA subset. This is from the BIRD data set. Still variation in similarity, but now uh, you're not going to see high correlations if you're just reliant on word overlap. And sure enough, spoiler, when we have the normal examples, we see what looks like very high correlation. When we switch to our controlled data set, those correlations are hovering right around chance. Paraphrase classification, same deal. Once we control just the amount of word overlap, we're no longer seeing any more than just marginally above chance performance in paraphrase classification, suggesting that if we had not done this control, we would think that this compositional meaning is being captured quite effectively. But once we control this, we see really fundamental limitations in terms of the extent to which this is being captured. Last example, and then I will summarize and wrap up. Um, context meaning for prediction in pre-trained language models. Here's our Sebastian example from before. What we want to ask here is to what extent, and Gary talked about this a bit, to what extent are models doing what humans are able to do, which is create a world model based on the new information that they're receiving, and then using that, deploying that to be able to make a robust and accurate prediction. You can imagine that models would probably do pretty good in this, pretty well in this case, but uh, it seems very clear that correct predictions in that case could rely on simpler heuristics like produce a capital associated with a recently mentioned country. So what we do to control for this is introduce attractor words, things that are irrelevant for the actual prediction, but that may uh, distract models if they're using these shallower heuristics. And sure enough, once again, same deal as before, once we introduce these attractors, we drop from basically perfect performance to roughly hovering around chance level performance with those distractors in there. So takeaways from those examples, confounds can have a very critical impact on our tests for composition and shallow heuristics like the one that we just saw with the just look at recent words and use uh, semantic associations can give a very strong illusion of compositional meaning understanding without careful controls. But if we use careful controls for these types of confounds and heuristics, they can quickly reveal pretty fundamental limitations in terms of models encoding and use of robust compositional meaning from language inputs. All right, so to summarize and wrap up, composition is the critical alternative to infinite memorization. For effective NLU, we need not just compositionality, but accurate human-like derivation of compositional meanings from language inputs. We have more syntactic angles, critical syntactic angles on compositionality involving binding to roles. We also have more semantic angles, say beyond just the binding to those roles. Once you know which things you're composing, which roles they have, how do we capture all of the rest of the nuances of those meanings and their implications for tasks? Supervised angles, important work focused on doing focused tests of compositional generaliz generalization in particular supervised settings and testing the limits of our models. Pre-trained NLU angles where we've been focusing, where we, we test compositional meaning capabilities in pre-trained LMs, trained in more naturalistic settings. In terms of the latter, um, if, if we go ahead and define what compositional meaning capability should look like in model representations and behaviors, and then carefully control confounds and heuristics that do not constitute systematic compositional meaning, we can increasingly successfully disentangle shallower behaviors from target compositional meaning understanding and get around the problem of the fact that we don't have perfect or necessarily even good understanding of what the model saw during training. So just to, to, to a final note, accurate systematic meaning composition is a critical open problem for NLU. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion and thank you to collaborators and funding sources and uh, everyone. Thanks very much for that lovely talk. Um, I, I forgot to tell Raphael that we are uh, maintaining a website going forward in which we have suggested readings from people's talks and so forth. Um, and uh, I think we should include Allison's uh, two papers that she closed with from 2020 and 2021. Um, and the people should construe those as amazing advice to anybody constructing benchmarks. Right? The whole, whole field right now is wrestling with the fact that large ma language models do really, really well on a lot of the benchmarks and yet still seem kind of clueless in some way. Um, the kind of controls that Allison's talking about, which remind me of lots of things that psycholinguists have thought about for a long time. We need to import those uh, into the AI context. And so we will put those up on, on a website that Raphael and I will uh, construct. Um, so thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, next, we're gonna have Paul Spolensky. I believe that I first met him in 1993 um, when I was either an assistant professor, I guess just finished my PhD, 
Um, and I remember what he told me was that nobody ever understood his 1988 paper the way that he intended. Um, and he kind of implied that maybe I'd be the one who would, and I'm not sure that I was or I ever did. Um, but I have uh, enjoyed conversations with Paul uh, ever since, always struggling basically with compositionality, whether um, there's any real alternative um, within the neural network community. This was before deep learning. And I think Paul has, part of the reason that Paul has perhaps been misunderstood is that he's trying to carve his own way. And I think people always try to assimilate what he is doing into what they're doing. And he's trying to discover something new. And I look forward to him telling us about the something new, which he's been looking, working on for a long time. And I think making pretty interesting progress. So take it away, Paul. Oh, and biographically, he's at Johns Hopkins and also at Microsoft. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me cue this up here. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> um, uh, thanks, Rafael and uh, Gary, for organizing the workshop and inviting me. Um, I've been working, as Gary said, on compositionality uh, in neural nets for a long time. Um, in their highly influential paper, Fodor and Polition argued that compositionality was a profound problem uh, for neural networks. And um, <clears throat> uh, in an extended back and forth uh, in the literature um, and uh, in an actual physical debate with the two of them, uh, I've argued that that problem can be overcome. <clears throat> For me, the challenge of compositionality in AI um, is quite simply de to develop an effective formalism for compositionality that resides in vector spaces. <clears throat> uh, an analysis and a proposed solution uh, to that challenge is presented in a pair of recent papers uh, with several collaborators. What we call this um, <clears throat> new approach is uh, neurocompositional computing. Uh, we argue that nascent forms of neurocompositionality are what give CNNs and transformers their boosted power. Uh, this we call first generation or 1G neurocompositional computing. We then go on to describe our work developing second generation neurocompositionality in AI, uh, which I'll discuss in this talk. <clears throat> um, we believe that achieving deep understanding in AI requires a new revolution in AI architecture, which requires that researchers have a general fundamental understanding of what it is that current AI systems don't understand. Uh, we think that current AI systems don't understand that the world is deeply compositional to a good first approximation. By compositional, uh, we mean loosely the same thing that Gary mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> For example, understanding that plans are composed of subplans, which are composed of sub subplans, um, and similarly for scenes and phrases and many other cognitive uh, domains. By current under uh, AI systems don't understand this, uh, <clears throat> what we mean is that they don't have a strong bias pushing them to encode the world compositionally, uh, which good old fashioned symbolic AI did have. Uh, which gave it robust compositional generalization, the crucial ability to understand arbitrary recombinations of familiar parts. But this was discrete compositionality and discreteness uh, is very limiting. Uh, deep neural nets power comes from continuity. So the next generation of AI systems needs to have encodings that are simultaneously continuous and compositional. Simultaneous means that unlike in hybrid systems, we need each individual representation to be both continuous and compositional. These encodings constitute a new type of representation, continuous compositional structure. This structure is what defines neural compositional computing and what I have to explain in this talk. <clears throat> so the key idea here is continuous compositionality, but what in the world is that? <clears throat> Here are two intuitive examples of continuous compositional structure. Continuous content is illustrated by the case of French uh, ami, which is pronounced tami or zami or nami, depending on the preceding word. 
Uh, in this paper, we propose that this word is stored in the French speaker's mental dictionary as this sequence. The first position is occupied by a blend of TN and Z in which each is weakly present with activation 0.09. Which of TNZ is pronounced, if any, is determined by the end of the previous word. Crucially, this blend is not probabilistic. Uh, these are all present simultaneously, but weakly. Continuity in structural relations rather than content is illustrated by spatial relations in scenes. So if I say, the painting is 1.2 meters above and 1.5 meters to the left of the table, then clearly I'm expressing a proposition in which the relation is continuous, not discrete. So our fundamental question is, how do we employ the power of continuous dense vector representations to achieve compositional processing? We start by decomposing the notion of compositional structure. Uh, we analyze compositional structure as being composed of uh, constituents which each bind together some content, the what, uh, with the form in which that uh, occurs, the where. Uh, we refer to the latter as roles and the former as fillers of those roles. Uh, structures are composed of constituents, each of which is a binding of the filler to a role. So for example, this simple symbol pair <clears throat> is a, uh, composed of a constituent with content lock and another with content able. This expression shows how the uh, contentful symbols are bound to their respective roles, left and right. The ordered pair structure um, as a structural type is defined by those two roles. And <clears throat> an uh, ordered pair token is defined by binding these roles uh, to particular fillers. Compositional structures contain substructures constituents in which the fillers themselves are whole structures, as shown here for nested pairs. <clears throat> Accessing constituents for compositional processing um, is done by what we call unbinding of roles. Uh, for the structure with substructure S1 filling role left and structure S2 filling role right, unbinding left returns the filler S1. A way of uh, using roles and fillers to specify the compositionality of a function is shown here. The value of f on this structure uh, is a function capital F applied to the, its value on the fillers of its roles left and right, which may themselves be structures, of course, as in unlockable. <clears throat> Equipped with a filler role decomposition of a type of compositional structure, here is how we embed uh, these elements in vector spaces. First, uh, we embed fillers as vectors, as is totally standard. Then we embed roles as vectors, a key innovation of this method. Constituents are embedded by a vector operation joining a filler vector to a role vector. It's called the tensor product, but we don't need to be concerned with it. Here's its definition, if you like. It's a generalization of the vector outer product that crucially can be applied recursively. We take the embedding vectors of all constituents and simply add them together. <clears throat> These embeddings are called tensor product representations <clears throat> and the computing platform they support is called Neurally Embedded Compositionally Structured Tensor Computer or NEXT Computing. Uh, and this is the form of second generation neural compositional computing we have been developing. In addition to building compositional structures, we need to be able to extract their constituents, uh, which means unbinding, and this is done with another vector operation. We've now created continuous compositional structure because fillers and even roles are now continuous vectors. Crucially, all formal properties are the same as for the discrete case. For example, we still have this equation, uh, even though all of the elements are now continuous. As an example of a type of non-discrete roles from linguistics, uh, recall that the vectors L and R uh, embed the roles left and right position in an ordered pair. 
Now C is the vector halfway between them, and it embeds a half strength rule that spans both positions. A T that is bound to this rule is a half strength T simultaneously occupying both positions. This is just what we propose in this paper as the representation of the medial T in French petit ami. Crucially, this continuous structure is subject to normal compositional processing of phonology. Uh, just a note for possible later discussion, we've shown that standard neural nets actually can learn TPRs, which are hidden in their hidden states, if you know how to look for them. To assess the sufficiency of next computing as a formalism for embedding compositionality in vector spaces, we have theoretical results on computability of AI relevant functions, functions in principle, and experimental results on learning models discussed in the next slide. Here are two examples of functions important for compositionality in linguistic semantics and syntax. Central to compositionality in linguistic semantics is function application, which requires binding a variable to a structural value. Uh, for a simple example, um, suppose the meaning of frog is some structure, m frog, uh, then to compute the meaning of big frog, we take a function that is the meaning of big and apply it to m frog. Stated over trees, the operation looks like this. <clears throat> and here's a more complex example of function application. Uh, we take a function expressing that p of x implies q of x, bind the variable x to a symbol a designating an entity, given p of a implies q of a, which looks like this in tree form. We can prove that when the trees are encoded as TPRs, this mapping can be computed with neural network operations. Next really does allow for strong structure sensitive variable binding. <clears throat> Turning to syntax, an important operation is tree adjoining. We start with an initial tree uh, and an auxiliary tree, and we insert the second in the middle of the first. Here's a concrete example of its use. As with beta reduction, with trees encoded as TPRs, tree adjoining can be computed with neural network operations as well. As far as learnability in practice, models have used next computing to address learnability in the following AI tasks. <clears throat> These models have deployed several new architectures built to process TPRs. See the recent review papers I cited for discussion of these architectures the models and the results obtained. Here is just one result. To test whether increased neurocompositionality from no neurocompositionality to first generation to second generation, increased compositional generalization on the simple symbol manipulation task, we compared three models, a standard re recurrent neural network with no neurocompositional structure, a standard transformer with modest first generation neurocompositional structure, and a second generation uh, TP transformer model, which is a transformer in which tensor products are used as hidden states. This plot shows the degree of out of training distribution generalization, the ultimate hope for benefit of compositionality as a function of the amount of training data. <clears throat> the 2G next model, blue curve, reaches 100% accuracy when trained on 700 examples. But the first generation transformer model, green curve, even after 1500 examples, has reached only 90%, while the non neurocompositional model has reached 80%. When multiple instances of each model are run, we can see how likely each model is to reach 100% out of distribution generalization. This plot shows that without neurocompositionality, this likelihood is essentially zero. Uh, with first generation, about one third. And with second generation, twice that. <clears throat> Overall, we see that indeed with increased neurocompositionality comes increased compositional generalization. <clears throat> so to conclude, um, I've tried to explain what it is we're advocating for, neuro for AI, neurocompositional computing. Um, why? Because we think deeper understanding requires continuous compositional encodings. Um, and we've 
shown how to do this by vector embedding the compositionality primitives in deep learning networks, what we call next computing. Uh, as for assessment, um, we've talked about some results about computability of complex uh, sim symbolic, uh, seemingly requiring discrete symbolic computation, but actually doable with next computation uh, functions like tree adjoining and um, function argument application uh, and the learnability and practice uh, of these kinds of continuous compositional representations in a number of AI tasks. So thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. And let me share my screen. All right, so I'll, I'll delve right in. Um, so uh, let me start uh, again with uh, this principle of compositionality that has already been mentioned. Uh, I suspect we'll, we'll hear more about the various meanings of compositionality tomorrow as well. Um, but the canonical expression of this principle from Barbara Party that has already been quoted is the following. The meaning of a whole is function of the meanings of the parts and of the way they are syntactically combined. However, there are a number of issues with that formulation as such, because it's underspecified. Uh, we can interpret what a whole and what a part is in different ways. Um, there is a question as to whether the um, meaning of the whole um, is a unique meaning or whether uh, it can have different, it can be assigned different meanings. And there is uh, also an implicature in that uh, formulation that um, the meaning of the whole is strictly determined by the meanings of the part together with the way they're syntactically combined. Uh, but that implicature need not be there. And in fact, that implicature causes some issues when we try to apply compositionality to natural language because there are other factors uh, in natural language. There are linguistic and extralinguistic phenomena that do not seem to abide by a strict determination of uh, the whole by the meaning of the parts and syntactic structure. Uh, Gary has already mentioned idioms. There are also various uh, contextual pragmatic considerations. So we can uh, rephrase the, 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 the principle in a, in a more uh, loose way or a weaker principle, which would be that the meaning of at least some complex expressions in at least, is at least partly determined by the meanings of their constituent parts together with their syntactic structure. And um, this formulation is loosely extensible to other domain than the linguistic domain, such as the visual domain. Uh, although this involves some uh, complex um, um, questions about how to apply the notion of syntax to uh, the realm of uh, images, for example, uh, because the spatial structure of images uh, is not quite like uh, linguistic uh, syntactic structure, and there are various, uh, there's a lot of work to try to make sense of that, but I will leave that aside. But roughly speaking, we can apply um, this notion of compositionality to language and to uh, some other domains. Now, compositionality is also uh, a term that is applied to a certain behavior, uh, namely uh, uh, the behavior that, that consists in uh, assigning a compositional meaning to uh, a complex expression or to a whole. Um, and so we uh, humans display that compositional behavior that previous speakers have mentioned, and we want AI systems that can uh, exhibit that same compositional behavior. So this is what we might mean when we say that some systems or some uh, agents or some speakers are compositional. Um, so uh, there have already been various illustrations of what compositional behavior might look like. Uh, here is a simple example for uh, a linguistic task uh, of, of text completion that you could give to an autoregressive language model. Uh, if you prompt it with man bites dog and you ask who needs urgent care, uh, you want the model to be able to respond to the dog uh, if it has assigned the correct compositional meaning to man bites dog. Um, in uh, cross-model domains, the vision language models, uh, you might want a text-to-image model to be able to uh, as Gary mentioned, uh, generate an image of a red cube on top of a blue cube that satisfies the compositional, st compositional structure of the prompt, and vice versa, an image captioning model uh, should be able to, to do the reverse operation. Um, and finally, you can think also of compositional behavior, in, even in the strict image-to-image -image domain, um, if you think of image segmentation, for example, where you want to parse uh, a whole image in terms of meaningful whole, uh, meaningful parts, uh, namely uh, objects. 
uh, here on the right, you have some labels assigned to the different parts, but you can have uh, image segmentation without linguistic labels. Finally, when we want to bridge uh, the level of behavior um, um, to some kind of understanding of the underlying mechanisms that enable the behavior, uh, we can talk about compositionality as a property of, of the underlying representations and computations that the systems are performing. Um, so here is an example from um, this influential paper by Lake and colleagues uh, from 2016. And they say compositionality is a classic idea that new representations can be constructed through the combination of primitive elements. And so this pertains um, to uh, not to behavior, but to how representations are structured and processed in the system. Uh, and again, uh, there is an issue here, namely that the relevant combination uh, is somewhat underspecified and can be understood in different ways. So in classical symbolic architectures, this is understood in terms of a constituency relation, uh, namely that when uh, a system tokens the mental representation red cube, uh, it is tokening uh, uh, co-tokening the representations red and cube. Uh, and so you have uh, this strict constituency uh, relation between the complex uh, representation and the underlying uh, constituent representations. But you can have a weaker notion of combination that doesn't appeal to constituency. Uh, and this is what has uh, already been uh, um, discussed by Paul in the previous presentation. Uh, you can have some composition functions such that uh, the uh, complex representation is derived in some meaningful and structured way from uh, the uh, uh, simpler representations without having a strict uh, relationship of constituency with code tokening. So if you think of the various uh, options uh, when it comes to trying to model uh, compositional behavior with artificial systems, uh, you have uh, old school classical symbolic systems that Gary has discussed. You have hybrid systems that were also mentioned. Uh, and then you have purely connectionist systems that only use artificial neural networks. And there is a classical uh, critic already mentioned uh, of connectionist systems, according to which connectionist systems lack a mechanism for combining representations compositionally. And so the question I want to raise is what have we learned uh, 34 years on, uh, is uh, to what extent is this critic uh, st still valid? And um, uh, specifically, uh, both the classical and the hybrid system um, implement combination, the combination of, of uh, uh, simple representations into complex uh, representations uh, through uh, this kind of constituency-based understanding of compositionality, whereas the connectionist uh, approach um, does things differently through this through what Paul called neurocompositional computing. And so I want to focus on uh, this idea that perhaps we can achieve compositional behavior without uh, um, constituency. So there are also methodological challenges that have already been mentioned. Uh, how can we systematically evaluate compositional behavior? This is a hard task because we don't have a standardized benchmark. There are various approaches that were already discussed by, by Alison. Uh, and uh, furthermore, how can we get an insight at the underlying mechanism? Suppose you observe the right kind of compositional behavior in your model. You want to know that this behavior is due to uh, a certain uh, composition function, and you want to understand what these composition functions uh, are doing. So I will start with um, um, what coincides more or less with that policy called the uh, semantic angle on compositionality. So the task of combining concepts, which is a form of syntax-like compositionality, if you will. Um, so if you think of phrasal nouns, for example, uh, um, understanding phrasal nouns require composing lexical meanings with minimal syntax uh, and with some uh, background knowledge. And uh, this is why uh, this uh, operation is not strictly compositional in the sense that it may involve uh, background knowledge in addition to the composition of the meanings of the constituent concepts. So uh, I want to mention this um, um, task that I designed with some colleagues for the, the Big Bench benchmark uh, that was trying to understand the extent to which language models can uh, uh, parse conceptual combinations, including novel conceptual combinations or concept conceptual combinations that are such that the, the, the complex concept has emergent properties that the constituent concepts don't have. So we have different subtasks. Uh, here is an example with made up words. Um, so uh, we take, we first define a word, this, and then another word, soup. So this means a person of means, soup means a person of humble origins. And then we prompt the model 
sorry, uh, asking which of the following sentences best characterizes these soups. So we have this complex conceptual combination and uh, we want the model to assign the highest log likelihood to uh, the first proposal here, these soups become rich during their lifetimes. So the whole bench, the whole task was designed uh, adversarially with some attractors to try to uh, rule out shallow heuristics that uh, Alison mentioned to, to as much as possible. Um, I'll, I'll skip that other example. So we have different subtasks. Some of them were real concepts. Some of them we've made up words. Um, and what was interesting is that we observed that um, on a lot of uh, um, big language models, including GPT-3, um, uh, this task was very, very hard. Uh, so you have here, you can see that uh, they're not doing much better than chance, uh, whereas the average human is doing much, much better than chance. So that's the um, uh, light blue line here. However, um, uh, there is this new large uh, language model from Google called Palm, which, ha which is even larger. It has 500, uh, 540 billion parameters. And on our task in the one-shot learning uh, regime and above, uh, it actually virtually uh, reached the human level. So uh, uh, that's quite interesting. And that speaks to the benefit of scaling um, that um, um, Gary has, has spoken against. And I think that, uh, uh, that together with a lot of other um, um, data points we have suggest that we should uh, take uh, scaling and the acquisition of emergent capabilities seriously, but I will, I will come back to that. So in uh, across modalities in the uh, visual linguistic uh, domain, uh, we can also observe that uh, recent models display some uh, behavior that seems to indicate that some forms of conceptual combinations are uh, done appropriately we, together with uh, some, some background um, uh, knowledge about how to compose uh, concepts appropriately. These are examples from um, uh, that, that from some tests I've, I've done with DALI2, uh, com uh, combining uh, different animal uh, concepts. These are other examples with Imogen uh, that were done by David Ha. Uh, uh, this has a little more syntactic structure, but uh, it's uh, combining the great wall of with different locations. And we can see that these models can do that fairly well. So what about more complex compositional behavior? Uh, already a lot has been said about this uh, in this panel. Um, but uh, again, the problem is that there is no standard test for that. It's complicated. Uh, Alison has mentioned how we can uh, either go with a supervised approach and with synthetic uh, bench data sets and benchmarks, or we can look at uh, pre-trained models, but then we have to rule out shallow heuristics and it, it's all uh, very challenging. So some um, um, uh, supervised approach that have been proposed uh, uh, are uh, the following. Uh, there are others. Uh, I will let um, the, the, the speakers for this, this workshop, Brendan Lake, uh, uh, Duke Hupskus and uh, um, Tal Lizen uh, discuss these in more detail tomorrow probably. Um, but what's interesting is that again, like with the task uh, that required to parse conceptual combinations, initial results on uh, these were somewhat underwhelming, suggesting that um, language models specifically uh, transformer-based models uh, show limited uh, capacity for compositional generalization and uh, limited uh, systematicity as well. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is that there are, there's some recent work that suggests that with some um, relatively minor tweaks to uh, the architecture of these models, uh, such as uh, relative positional encodings and uh, weight sharing, you can drastically improve performance on these benchmarks. So here are some examples. Um, and uh, you could arguably put also um, the uh, second generation neurocompositional computing that uh, um, Paul mentioned, namely the tensor product transformers as also uh, a modification of the transformer architecture that enables it to achieve much greater performance. Uh, so again, in the visual linguistic domain, uh, here is a very complex compositional prompt. A wombat sits in a yellow chair, yellow beach chair while sipping a martini that is out of, that is on his laptop keyboard. The wombat is wearing a white Panama hat and a floral Hawaiian shirt, out of focus palm trees in the background. So I tested this on, on as this prompt on, on DALI2 and it's doing uh, pretty poorly overall, uh, failing to bind uh, uh, properties and, and objects uh, appropriately, uh, also just omitting some parts of the prompt. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion about this, but I suspect this is largely due to its architecture. And this is why um, the examples given by Gary with DALI2, I think, 
uh, it's hard to extrapolate from these to the capacities of text to image model more generally. Um, and we can talk about this in the discussion, sorry. Um, but the way in which uh, the clip model that is uh, part of uh, DALI2 is trained contrastively, I think, uh, limits its ability to induce syntactic structure. And this is why we see these failure modes. If you look at the recent model unveiled by, by Google, uh, you can see that it can uh, parse this prompt uh, virtually perfectly. Obviously, this comes with the usual caveat. This is a cherry-picked uh, uh, example because I don't have access to party. This is not tested systematically, but uh, it seems like the that the the, the autoregressive architecture uh, of party is much more able to um, uh, parse this kind of prompt, even very complex prompt compositionally. So I think one of the lessons from this is that the devil is in the details when it comes to compositional behavior. Uh, the architecture of the models and the inductive biases matter enormously. Um, there is now uh, compelling converging evidence that self-attention is a very powerful mechanism to induce structure, and uh, minor tricks of uh, the vanilla transformer architecture can go a long way, as I've already mentioned. The learning objective also matters. I've just mentioned the example of contrastive learning. It seems like that masked language uh, or masked token modeling more generally, because you can apply mask modeling to images too. Uh, and I would include in this broad category of masked modeling also next word prediction or next token prediction uh, might be superior as learning objective to contrastive learning uh, in order to induce uh, compositional structure. Model size also matters. We have increasing evidence that scaling uh, these models well is not, I, I would completely agree with, with Gary, that it's not all we need. Uh, it is uh, indeed uh, quite important and uh, this is why it's tricky to extrapolate from certain tests done on smaller transformer models like BERT to uh, the capacities of larger models. And finally, uh, there is also emerging evidence that the structure of the data set itself is very important. Uh, with these large pre-trained models, uh, Stefan and Chantumo will, uh, I think, talk more about this, uh, but this is uh, another aspect uh, of this uh, puzzle that is, that is important. Um, so, uh, I will be quick because uh, in the interest of time, but um, I think what, what, what something I'm very interested in now is moving past just looking at the behavior of these models and trying to gain a mechanistic understanding of what they're doing and what kind of underlying mechanism might underlie their capacity uh, for uh, to induce compositional structure. Um, and there is uh, recent work, especially from Chris Ola's team at Anthropic uh, with toy models that uh, suggests that uh, transformer models can effectively implement complex algorithms using compositions of attention heads uh, that keep track or can keep track uh, of compositional structure, at least in some cases. Uh, and these attention heads get specialized. Some of them, for example, could specialize on tracking subject verb agreements. Some of them could specialize on more complex, uh, um, uh, tracking more complex relationships and dependencies. Um, but it seems that the uh, uh, um, composition of attention uh, heads uh, with several layers is a very expressive and powerful system uh, to induce compositional structure. And in more high level philosophical terms, I think uh, this suggests that transformer models are capable of inducing a repertoire of what Nick Shea called non content specific computations, that is, computations that are independent of the particular values of the rep representations taken as input. And this is why I think it's uh, somewhat misleading to characterize this, what these large models are doing as uh, just uh, big lookup tables um, or as just you know, statistical pattern matching. Um, in particular, uh, I think we can say that uh, uh, these, these models approximate uh, a form of viable binding. Some people have called that soft viable binding by dynamic, dynamically rotting information in layer subspaces that acts as a memory. This is also uh, con consistent with what uh, uh, Chris Orla and colleagues have found. Uh, and this is what Paul has called uh, first generation neurocompositional computing. Uh, and I guess there is a question here as to whether uh, we need to uh, uh, have a more uh, um, uh, like stronger priors for variable binding through the uh, introduction of, of uh, tensor product representations or whether we can induce that with this so-called first generation neurocompositional computing uh, when we scale up the models and maybe add some uh, minor tweaks to the architecture such as those already mentioned. And I think, um, again, this is very preliminary, uh, much more, more work needs to be done, but I think uh, uh, this uh, goes a long way towards uh, 
explaining how we could get in principle compositional behavior uh, from these uh, transformer models and various variants of these models. Uh, and also it goes a long way towards explaining uh, their remarkable capacity for in-context learning. But further investigation is needed to track specific computations in these models. Um, I will skip this in the interest of time. This was an example from Chinchilla of uh, 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 this kind of soft fireball binding I was talking about. Um, so in conclusion, I think deep neural networks can be given the resources to behave compositionally by inducing suitable composition functions if they have the right features, that if, is, if, if they are induced with the right kind of architecture and active biases, with the right kind of learning objective, with the right kind of uh, uh, parameter, uh, number of parameters or, or model size, and if they are trained on the right kind of data with the right structure. Uh, that's a lot of ifs, but I think if we want to make uh, sweeping claims about what uh, connectionist models are able to achieve and whether uh, they're able to uh, um, handle compositionality, uh, we uh, need to be mindful of how these different features affect uh, the results we get from these models. Um, I think uh, these, the, the, the work that I've mentioned, the research that I've mentioned, suggests that compositionality does not require constituent structure, uh, as hypothesized by, by Fodor and others. Uh, indeed, we can induce powerful composition functions uh, on vector representations, continuous real-valued vector representations uh, in models based, for example, on the transformer architecture uh, that do not involve the strict co-tokening uh, relation between simple representations and more complex representations. Um, this is also consistent with the neural compositional paradigm that Paul has discussed previously. And uh, relinquishing constituency uh, and the classical symbolic approach uh, comes with significant uh, challenges. These have also been discussed already by, by Allison, uh, uh, but also benefits that have been discussed by, by Paul, right? Because uh, once we have these real valued continuous representations, uh, uh, we can uh, tackle uh, some compositional challenges in the real world in ways that are less rigid and more flexible than what one could do with um, symbolic classical architectures. Uh, and there is a broader question here as to what the recent progress uh, of uh, deep learning models when it comes to compositional behavior uh, can, uh, how it can inform uh, work in, in community science to understand compositionality in humans. Uh, it has been a long-standing question in, in particular in, in cognitive uh, computational neuroscience to try to understand how uh, composition, the compositional behavior that humans exhibit is implemented in the brain. Uh, and I think uh, studying these models uh, can give us some give us some hints uh, as to how that that happens. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, there's a lot to talk about. We have 40 minutes left today. I'm going to give priority to the panelists, but also take some questions from the crowd. Raphael will help me in the moderation. I'm going to maybe ask the first one. Um, I want to remind everyone that there's a QA feature. I think most of you have discovered it by now in the bottom uh, towards the right of your screen, I guess. And so you can both post questions and vote on them. This is not a democracy. Um, we will not necessarily start with the most highest ranked and so forth, but you know, we, we will take your, your uh, feedback as input. Um, so I, I'm going to ask one question. Uh, maybe Raphael will ask the next. And we'll let the panelists jump in. Brendan, if you're listening, there's a different link you could use so that you could pop up on the panelist part of the screen. Um, all right, so here's my question. Raphael and Paul seem to be talking about the same thing in some ways, but in others, I think they're not really, and I'm not sure how compatible their visions are. So they're both pushing for neural networks to handle some of the things that compositionality uh, is concerned with. Raphael is in some ways taking a stronger line that maybe we don't really need compositionality as such per se. Maybe we could abandon constituency uh, <coughs> and have something else. Um, I think he's made a, a strong rejoinder to the simplest version of what Allison said about pure memorization. I think is right that there's more than memorization here. But I think Allison's remarks still loom large in terms of how you would show this and whether you're really getting it out of current neural networks. So there's Raphael. It sounds a little bit compatible with Paul, but Paul actually, as far as I understand it, really wants to keep constituency structure in the classical sense. He wants to have compositionality, but he wants to implement it with something that's a little different from neural networks. And on the one hand, Raphael thinks 
if we get our objective function straight, if we get our data practices in order, we'll kind of be able to use the large language models more or less as they are. And Paul's saying that's first generation. I get something new that's second generation. So first I wanted to highlight what I think is some actual tension there that's not, wasn't completely brought out. And then I'm gonna start with the question to Paul, but hopefully Raphael and maybe others will jump in, which is Paul, how hard is it to use what you've got as a kind of drop-in replacement or drop-in supplement, or even how do you think about that relative to large language models? So like the dream right now, that it feels like we can taste, but maybe we, it's only a tease, is you can talk to your system about anything, right? You can talk to the GPT-3 about anything is not particularly reliable, but you can you get this immense broad coverage. You know, could you take what you're doing, Paul, and throw that into a system with equal coverage, but more reliability? AI21 has kind of done that, but it's with domains. So like they've shown for 30 domains going in a very explicitly neurosymbolic uh, uh, direction that they can, you know, answer questions about weather or recent history or, or whatever, but they don't have it in a fully general way. The dream is like fully general. It's like AGI in a box. And having you know better compositionality put into a broad context would be awesome. But like, how do you do that engineering? Can you do that engineering for you, Paul? The first version of the question: Do you want GPT three at all, or do you want to you know completely restructure all of this on top of what you're building? How do you think about all that, Paul? Um, well, the um, question that Raphael raised, I think, is very much a question in my mind whether we need more than what we have uh, with uh, transformer architecture uh, and the like, um, plus huge scale. Um, I'm making a bet that we need more uh, for a lot of the same reasons that you, Gary, uh, are making that bet. Um, uh, I do believe it can't be a coincidence that all studies of cognition for 2000 years have shown that it's highly compositional. It's not exactly compositional, but that doesn't detract from the fact that it is highly compositional. Composition only goes a huge way to uh, describing cognitive knowledge and uh, computate and um, function. Uh, I can't believe that that's uh, an irrelevant fact for building intelligent machines. It may be, but uh, my bet is it isn't. And that uh, what we need is for deep learning uh, to have uh, access, not just to statistics, uh, but to this kind of structure as well. Um, but that we can put the structure in the vector space uh, so that it co-resides with the statistical learning perfectly um, and allows you to have uh, non-discrete compositional knowledge, which is much more flexible in principle. Uh, just the way that, you know, we, we've seen that replacing a, a symbol for a word in that NLP with a vector has huge benefit. And the claim here is that if you do the same thing for roles, in structures, not just fillers, you'll get another huge benefit from allowing the structural uh, uh, web itself to be continuous in the way that uh, we now have um, vectors for symbols. Uh, but that's a bet. And um, we have uh, explored the tensor product transformer uh, quite a bit. Um, and it is a drop-in replacement where you just take a transformer uh, and um, at e in each cell of the transformer where we would otherwise have a hidden uh, representation that's essentially unstructured, uh, you put a tensor product representation there. You allow it to invent roles and fillers uh, to uh, encode its information uh, so that now you have, in a sense, the best of both worlds. You can do that for training large language models if you want. We have not ha applied the resources to do that. But um, in principle, uh, incorporating these neural compositionality principles into existing uh, large-scale language models is perfectly consistent with what we're uh, proposing. Um, <clears throat> um, did I address everything? Yeah, yeah. it's a good so, answer. I'd like to see if it works. Raphael, do you want to? Yeah, so I, I'm, I mean, uh, I, I don't want to make a strong prediction as to whether uh, we need something like tensor product representations to be built into the architecture uh, or not. I think it's an open question. Um, but I think one, one point that, that all of these highlights is uh, the importance of inductive biases and the fact that, you know, the debate cannot be set simplistically as a, as a, as a uh, pitting uh, against each other 
a kind of tabula rasa approach, which would be connectionism and uh, uh, an approach with uh, strong uh, um, uh, structure, which would be the classical symbolic approach. Because um, in fact, uh, uh, all of all of this research, including Paul's research, suggests that endowing connectionist models with the right kind of structure through uh, or, or, or um, uh, inductive biases to induce structure uh, is very important. And uh, these are certainly not starting from uh, from nothing. So the real question is, what kind of uh, bias is the right one? Um, um, you know, what kind of tweaks to the vanilla uh, transformer architecture can endow it with more? Um, uh, more compositionality. Uh, I guess I, I call these tweaks. I guess it's, it's debatable whether uh, you can you can whether there's something more than than just uh, minor modifications of the architecture. But uh, the point remains that I do think we can bridge the gap between compositional behavior in humans and machines without having to resort to uh, hybrid uh, neurosymbolic architecture. And I guess that's the the, the disagreement I have with, with you, uh, Gary. I'm going to let Ellie, who hasn't spoken yet, but will be a speaker tomorrow, uh, jump in and then come back to Paul. Thanks. Um, actually, yeah, I'm curious to hear the answer to that question. I, I wanted to ask for clarification, though, um, on just how much Paul and Raphael disagreed. So what you said, Gary, because I couldn't actually, I'm not sure I totally followed how much uh, like what about what you were describing Raphael this kind of derivation non co-tokening counts as not constituency structure and whether Paul's formulation has constituency structure like by that same definite like to me it seemed like basically you were doing us proposing a similar thing but Raphael you consider that not constituency and Paul considers it constituency and so I was since this seems to actually be really important, it seems like what we're actually talking about is constituency, not compositionality, or, or not compositionality broadly, but specifically constituency. It seems like we should define that. I'm just curious whether you guys agree and are just defining constituency differently or disagree on that. And hang on, I'm interposing for two seconds so we don't lose the whole audience. Not everybody here knows what constituency structure even means. Um, I could give a definition, but probably somebody, Tal is the linguist among us, he could, he could give a classic definition of constituency, He's, uh, or I'll just, I'll just wing it. So um, when we're talking about constituency, we're saying that a, lo a large thing is made up of um, well-defined pieces, and those pieces are the constituencies. So when you say, um, John, uh, or, or I don't know, John loves uh, the water, the water is a constituent that we call a noun phrase, it's a piece that's interchangeable with other pieces. And the question is, do we need our neural networks, if we're indeed going to use neural networks, to explicitly represent the particular constituencies, those pieces, which can be larger than a word, there may be phrases and things like that, or can we do without that and sort of do things in a more holistic way? I think that's the question before us. I think so. Um, Ellie is pushing Paul to um, harder on his views on that, which I think is a yeah. good, good thing. So and, and sorry, and I would just, so I think that the thing that's at issue with constituency that seems um, is this particular issue of kind of co-tokening, which I think is what kind of Fodor ra rails on with his, which is like, you can't think about the concept of red car without thinking about the concept red and the concept car. So they are literally parts of the representation of the whole. Um, and I think it's that kind of the representation of the parts are literally part of the representation of the whole that kind of seems to be really important. Um, talking about this issue. And that seemed to be the, the part that Raphael was saying he wasn't doing. And I'm not sure whether Paul thinks he's doing or is doing. Yeah. So back to you, Paul. Well, I think that uh, notion of co-tokening is ill-defined. I think that using words like, um, uh, you know, real constituency um, shows that we have a problem here. Um, and uh, what I like to say is that if you form a, tensor product representation uh, of a tree. Uh, you can do all the stuff with the tree that you would normally do in symbolic computation. How could that not be constituent structure? Um, but in putting that aside, uh, that the different uh, constituents um, are present together, but they add together. They don't sit next to each other. And I don't think that uh, sitting next to each other is the right way to think about combination. In neural computation, it's superposition or adding that counts. And so the different words uh, in this TPR for a tree uh, are 
co-present in exactly the same sense, literally, that the electrons and the, and the protons are co-present in, in the state uh, of an atom. They are superimposed on each other, um, uh, but they are accessible despite the fact that they're superimposed on each other. You could pull them out. You can do processing that depends on which parts are in the mix. Uh, and so you get the advantages uh, or the, the functionality that you need for compositional structure. So in, a, in a classical framework, what you might do is, let's say if you're parsing a sentence, you might maintain multiple representations for different possible meanings. Um, it's sort of a different way of thinking about superpositionality, maybe less elegant in some ways. And what Paul wants to do is you kind of convolve these into a single representation that you could simultaneously operate over. You could see advantages in both ways. You could imagine the system might actually avail itself of both techniques. And, and so in what way was, um, Raphael, what you were describing, the derivation picture, to me, this sounds like that. And I would agree with Paul that this seems like a, I would count it as constituency structure. So I was trying to understand if what you felt was a mean, a meaningful, not constituency structure version of the derivation set. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, um, First of all, I, I, you know, I, 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 I agree that uh, this is the, the the way to go. So uh, whether it's done with tensor products or uh, in, in a different way, but I guess the question of uh, whether you should call it constituency is uh, partly a, a matter of semantics, right? So what um, what's different is that with a classical constituency relation. Uh, as Paul mentioned, you just uh, co token, put together the uh, uh, instantiate the, 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 the two uh, constituent representations together to form the complex representation. Uh, whereas with vector representations, when you combine them, you get a new vector that uh, um, have, uh, you know, has uh, uh, different, uh, um, uh, different values than the, the two con constituent quote unquote vectors, right? So it's a form of, con of, of it's, it's, if it's a form of constituency, it's a constituency in a slightly uh, different sense from the sense that uh, someone like Fodor intended. But I'm not, I'm not opposed to um, calling it constituency. I'm just pointing out that the stronger notion of constituency that's, that's involved in uh, classical symbolic approaches uh, should be kept apart from the notion of compositionality. Otherwise, we're just begging the question if we assume that compositionality require this strong constituency relation in the form of the co-tokening of representations. Um, and uh, if we drop that assumption, then we can have this uh, more malleable, weaker notion of constituency, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, that I think is more expressive and more powerful and more flexible. So I think, I think we, we all, well, I don't know about all, but I agree with Paul on that. I, I like to think about it this way. There is a, an abstract notion of a compositional structure um, which supports uh, abstractions about compositional functions and compositional algorithms and so on. Um, and we need to formalize that to build a com computational system with it. We need to formalize it one way. And in classical uh, theory, it's formalized using discrete computation and discrete symbol structures in which what it means to co-token is to have one thing sit next to each another, okay? That in some sense, they are really separable uh, uh, in almost a, a physical sense. That's what Fodor wanted. Um, that's one way of formalizing the abstract notion of compositionality. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's another way that you can do it with continuous, not discrete representations. And you can take all that functionality and you can uh, get it out of uh, a continuously um, formalized version of compositionality, uh, which has the benefits of the discrete uh, case, but it doesn't have the disadvantages that discreteness brings with it. Um, that's how I think about the relationship between these two. Um, they're just different formalizations, one in discrete mathematics, one in continuous mathematics, of the same more abstract notion uh, that spans them both. In, in my view, there, there's something that's up for grabs and something that's not. And this is just my view. But in, in my view, what's up for grabs <coughs> is or sorry, what's not up for grabs is I don't see how you can make the system work unless you can get back out to the constituent parts. Um, what is up for grabs is can you do some really cool continuous computation on top of that that helps you a lot? And I feel like Paul is really exploring that hypothesis and there's every reason to explore it. But for me, it's not, def 
the constituency isn't a like definitional loose semantic thing. Either you have it or you don't, but then maybe you can do some really neat stuff in addition. So, I mean, I think my view and Paul's are pretty similar. And Tal has raised his hand and we hasn't spoken. So Tal, take it away. Um, yeah, so I, I agree that uh, consistency is important on some level. I guess the uh, debate here is whether it can emerge, um, whether you can identify it post hoc and after training in the vector representations of the um, language model that you train. And I think that there's some evidence that it's possible to do that and it might become uh, this isomorphism, I guess, between the vectors and whatever symbolic representation you think is the right one uh, might become uh, more kind of accurate the larger the model is, the, the data set is that the model is trained on. Um, so, so suppose... Yeah, so I, so I guess th those two things might don't have to be in conflict. Like you, you might be right that the way to solve the problem involves uh, constituency and compositionality, um, but those properties can emerge uh, in a deep learning system. So, so I would take it, and you can agree or disagree, and Paul can also weigh in, um, that if Paul's system turned out to be right, that then constituency and compositionality would be innate. Like they are innate in his system. They're the architectural choices that are made to separate the roles and the filters and fillers and how to put them together. And there it is innate. Whereas if you could get GPT-3 to behave as if, if, as if it were compositional across the set of benchmarks that we'll talk about yesterday, I mean, sorry, tomorrow that are real and imagined and so forth, um, then you could say, okay, maybe you can learn it. But if Paul's system were the only one to work, then I think it would actually be a victory for innateness, for the innateness in particular of roles and fillers and so forth. Do you agree with that, Tal? Then Paul and Ellie. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, the only thing that uh, maybe I might take issue with is you said that the system might behave as if it's compositional. Um, and I think that at least hypothetically, you can imagine that the vector representation that it uh, develops are exactly the representation that Paul thinks uh, the system should develop right, right, without right. this sort so of structure. That's right. if, bias. If you didn't hardwire Paul's right. solution, but you converged yeah. on it by tweaking the data set and increasing the scale and so forth. And then you actually, by magic, not by magic, that's not a fair way to say it, by, by something wound up with Paul's stuff, then you would say, no, what was innate was the transformer architecture. And Paul's stuff is the thing that it acquired um, in the course of experience. And that would be an interesting result for sure. Right. Well, Paul and then Ellie, if you're still in. Not only would it be an interesting result, it is an interesting result. There are two papers on archive about this exact uh, phenomenon happening um, in uh, recurrent neural networks. Uh, so Tom McCoy and Paul Sulos have papers about this, showing that in the in a an RNN that learns to do the scan task, you can decompose the hidden state that it learns without any kind of innate uh, pressure to do so. Uh, it learns uh, tensor product representations on its own, linearly transformed. Um, and so this means that the notion of tensor product representation might ultimately end up uh, not being used for designing networks, but for analyzing and understanding them. Maybe we understand how this network does the scan task because we can see what it, how it has compositionally structured internal representations that it has learned. And so there's another bet going on here in what I was describing, which is that uh, if you have enough data and enough patience and enough compute, then maybe without any bias in that direction, models will come to this solution. Because I do believe that in the world of vector spaces these models live in, it is the way to do it, and they will find it, and they do. Um, however, if we give it uh, innate structure of the sort that allows it to build and take apart uh, uh, compositional representations, uh, I think that that kind of inductive bias may allow it to learn like people do without having to have, uh, you know, terabytes of training data to get to this point. Um, and also to have a more reliable endpoint where we get a more robust compositional generalization from less data. That's a bet um, that without these biases, we're not going to see that. But with these biases, we can. I'm going to give Allison and then Ellie, if she wants, maybe oh, Raphael. I, actually, and then... I was going to make the same point and link okay. to the same paper. So I've been, yeah, no need to. Allison, ahead, Allison. And, then, and then I'm going to take an uh, audience question. Allison. It looked like Paul wanted to finish maybe his comment. Did you want to oh, just? I, I just want to say Tal was being modest. He's a co-author on both of those papers, by the way. Oh, 
Mm. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make a couple of accumulated comments. One is with respect to sort of constituency syntactic information uh, that, that Paul's very rightfully focusing on and that we've been asking about moments ago with respect to pre-trained language models. I think that there's a lot of compelling evidence to suggest that this is an emergent type of information that we are seeing in, in pre-trained language models. If anything, I think they're capturing a lot of syntactic information. This is a type of information that is encoded and recoverable from these types of models. So I think that I think we already have evidence that that is something that can be an emergent property. I would emphasize that this is sort of one of the reasons that I tend to make this syntactic angles, semantic angles distinction, because beyond encoding this type of syntactic information that models seem to have picked up on to a significant extent, we also need all of the rest of uh, what it means to have ca to, to capture meaning and you know, beyond just knowing sort of what the semantic syntactic roles are, what the order of combination is, et cetera. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would emphasize, that all of this is very important, but I think we're actually already seeing that even if you don't build in syntax ahead of time, you end up seeing syntax as an emergent property. Um, the final thing I wanted to just note, because Gary was mentioning uh, sort of phrasing along the lines of then we know it's innate, and I think we just want to be very careful about how we talk about innateness with respect to these types of artificial models, because of course we know unlike brains, we know exactly what we built in to these models. And so the question is more, what types of inductive biases do we need? Which things do we need to build in ahead of time and which things can be emergent depending on the interaction between what inductive biases we have and what um, signal learning signal we have. So, so we have an audience question that's, that's maybe also a question for you, Alison. Uh, can you get compositionality of meanings without primitives that are meaningful and treated as meaningful by the system? Can you get, I might need to ask for clarification. Can you get, uh, compositionality with primitives that are not meaningful? Is that the question? Yes, yeah. so get compositionality without primitives that are meaningful uh, mm. and, and without primitives that are treated as meaningful by the system. I think that you may uh, as ascribe more or less uh, meaning to the primitive itself. You may consider the, the primitive to have more of a functional meaning in terms of how it influences the ultimate outcome. We can have more uh, focus on, on the sort of the strength of the composition function or functions or more focus on the content of the meanings and, and how that sort of prescribes ahead of time what's going to happen during the composition process. So I think we can sort of uh, vary a bit in terms of the way that we think about that. But I think that the factor remains that you need to have a sense of systematically when you create novel combinations of things, what is going to happen. So whether that is informed by your understanding of the meaning, this is probably going to be more what we would think about with content words, with function words, and maybe more along the lines of when this combines with something, what effect does it have on the final output representation? Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's where I would fall on that. I think the important thing that, that we need to focus on is the fact that you do need to know something about the words. If you just have a completely unknown word with no meaning or functional uh, uh, instructions whatsoever, I, I I would be inclined to say that, no, you can't make use of such a word in composition. <laughs> Thanks. Gary, you want to take another audience question? Yeah, let, let's, uh, we can be a little bit democratic here. Um, uh, <clears throat> another popular question. Um, how do you think about the semantics, and this is really for the whole panel. How do you think about the semantics pragmatics distinction in the context of this discussion? We haven't really talked about it at all. Um, the meaning of natural language is not just either a matter of pure semantics from syntax, or idiomatic retrieval, that's true. I mean, I certainly oversimplified that in my talk. Um, my pathway one, I guess they're referring to, must also incorporate pragmatic rules. Um, do you see pragmatics as a second step after the first step? Does it have to be incorporated into the first step? To some extent that's directed at me, so I'll, I'll start, but everybody can jump in. I totally oversimplified the pragmatics part, except that I left a little um, uh, pointer to it in terms of the cognitive models. So the way I think of the pragmatics is it's, it's mediated through those um, cognitive models. Pragmatics can be all sorts of different things. It can be telling us what is a plausible referent for something. So if I say, you know, put the cup on the table, is there a table there? And there, there are um, all kinds of complicated examples where your knowledge of the real world helps you disambiguate things. There's also the pragmatics of if, if I say, um, can you pass the salt? Then I want you to pass me the salt, but I'm asking you know, about your possibility rather than directly giving you a request. And there's all of that kind of indirect speech and, and so forth. Um, there are longstanding arguments within the field of psycholinguistics about how humans do this. 
in general, people are opportunistic. They use whatever knowledge is available. They use it quite quickly. This classic uh, paper by Tannenhaus and some others in science around 1995 that, that showed that um, with respect to real world reference. Um, I, I think this stuff is terrifically important. I don't think it's possible unless you have cognitive models of the world. I think you kind of fake it again with GPT-3 because you have all of these contexts that it is referring to, and sometimes it gets it right by reference to the similarity in the specific words, and sometimes it doesn't. I don't feel like it's a rich enough basis to really get the pragmatics right. You can only really do that if you have reasoning and cognitive models about what's going on, such that you can decide what's a plausible reference, what is the speaker trying to achieve, and so forth. So I, I apologize for short-circuiting it um, or short-shifting it in, in uh, my own piece, but I think the cognitive models are, are the departure point for doing that stuff. And I don't know if other people want to speak to that or not. If not, if not, we have two specific questions for Paul um, that are, I think, quickies, and then we can see where we go with what time we have left. So um, my longtime collaborator, Ernie Davis, who's a um, specialist in common sense uh, at, at NYU says, Paul, um, are your vector representations of individual words close to widely used word embeddings like word devec, are they very, very different? And it relates to my bit about stable encodings. I assume they're stable encodings, but you know, be a little bit more explicit about what you use as representations for individual items and also where you get the encodings for the fillers. Um, well, um, the um, encodings for uh, roles and fillers and the choice of what roles to use uh, uh, for which fillers um, is learned end to end in our uh, TP transformer models and others. Um, and uh, we see um, uh, semantically uh, sensible relationships in the similarity structure among these vectors often, um, but have uh, not compared them to um, word to vec. The um, way they are learned in our models is uh, to subserve the needs of a particular task that this compositional structure is subserving, uh, whereas word to vec vectors are uh, all about predicting uh, other words. Um, and so if you were to use this kind of model for that kind of task, then you would expect to get things that look like word to vec vectors, uh, but we've used it for other tasks where there isn't any reason to expect that uh, outcome. Mm. Does that make sense? And another, I think it's a reasonable answer. Another question from anonymous attendee is, at Paul, what distinguishes next computing from the style of PD PDP computing you worked on in the 80s using tensor bindings. So what's new here, Paul? Um, uh, deep learning. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, to be frank, uh, I avoided my learning during the entire <laughs> first, most of my career because I, I feel that you can't understand the results of learning. So for me, it's not very satisfying. Um, that was true uh, in the 80s and so on, uh, to some extent, and got more true as the models got bigger and so on. Um, but uh, then I realized that um, the, the deep learning was uh, so good at uh, finding its way through these enormous vector spaces to, to useful places, uh, that it would be fascinating to know that if deep learning were given the opportunity to create structures, invent its own roles and fillers, uh, decide what kind of structuring it should apply to its data, um, that it would be really interesting to see what comes out of that and maybe instructive for cognitive science, maybe not. Uh, so uh, I wanted to see when we combine this with deep learning, uh, what happens. Um, mm. Another question here from Kanishka Misra. Um, is, and this is maybe Allison starts with this, but everybody could jump in. Is human cognition always compositional? I remember studies in conceptual combination where people were asked to list the extension of sports, which are games, games which are sports and the two lists had substantial difference. A fully compositional <coughs> system will likely have the list to be exactly the same. I'm not sure I agree with the premise, but um, we do not see that in the experiment, that in this experiment with humans. This makes me think strict compositionality might be too extreme to display behavior that is similar to humans. Allison and anybody else who wants to jump in. Sure, yeah. Um, I, uh, I do agree with Gary. I, I don't think we would expect a compositional system to produce uh, identical things for those. I think this is exactly the point of compositionality being more than just word content. Um, I, I think that it is actually pretty uh, systematically derivable on the basis of the way that we know that 
how words combine to we can explain why, why you're seeing the difference that you're seeing there. Um, so I'm not sure if that is necessarily the example that we need, but of course, as I emphasized uh, in my in my talk, the memorization, it, like, no, of course not. It's not strictly compositional language. It's not strictly compositional. There are aspects of it that require memorization. You need, for instance, to memorize meanings of individual words. You need to memorize the meanings of idioms that are not compositional. So absolutely, it, it, we, we do need, very much need to be careful about mm -hmm making sure that we do build in the capacity to memorize the aspects of language that are just simply going to need to be memorized because there's no way to derive them compositionally. So very much so, yeah. There's a classic paper by Lila Gleitman and some others on um, China is like North Korea versus North Korea is like China um, in terms of the foreground and the background and what's being compared. It's kind of on the interface of, of discourse syntax and semantics and shows how subtle these things are. So it's I mean, adding to what Allison said, it's not just having the same words in the right order and so forth. Like order can get reflected in pretty subtle ways in terms of like how you represent something with relation to your representation of the world model um, in ways that if you haven't thought carefully about linguistics and presupposition, for example, as, as one piece of linguistics um, aren't obvious to the eye. And, and so that's a fun paper. I'll try to put it up on the website if I remember. Someone can email me, send me that Gleitman uh, asymmetry paper. Um, let's see. We have time for a couple more questions. How about if the panel asks uh, questions to each other? Does anybody on the panel, um, speakers today or not, um, <coughs> want to ask each other questions? Um, if there is quiet, I can certainly well, always come I can, up I can ask a question um, um, go for it of, of Allison um, I think um, we've already discussed it with Raphael to some degree um, wh what do you think the takeaway message is from your uh, work to date about uh, whether uh, some kind of um, uh, innate uh, capabilities for dealing with compositional structure um, will be called for to get uh, to solve the problems that you identify? Yeah, so innate structure, I guess we would want to define a little, a little more. Um, uh, obviously, we're going to need inductive biases of some kind for learning to proceed. So um, if we mean innate structure, like do we need to build in syntax? I think there's a good chance that not, since we're seeing, uh, again, you know, based on the fact that we're seeing uh, it's pretty compelling emergent syntax. Um, the, the main takeaway that I tend to highlight in talking about sort of what are we ultimately going to need is that in, in our work focusing on um, trying to sort of disentangle more heuristic based behavior from more robust compositional behavior in pre-trained language models is that repeatedly what we find is that the, the, the heuristics that we end up seeing are almost trivially obvious based on the way that language models work, right? <laughs> the types of things where once you see them, people say, well, of course, they're, you know, we're using the heuristics because they were optimized on word prediction, and that's something that would be helpful for word prediction. So because, but, but, but this is both obvious and extremely critical, because if what we're finding is that over and over again, we have heuristics that are extremely effective for optimizing this particular objective, the, the word or token prediction objective, which do not constitute compositional meaning, then there's a, a, a good chance that compositional meaning is not something that is going to be forced by language modeling per se. Rather, we're going to end up seeing you know, lots of really sophisticated heuristics that produce very compelling generated text, very compelling predictions in context, but that don't, but, but we never reached a point where the model in order to optimize that objective was forced to learn the entire system of, of compositional meaning because it just didn't need to, it wasn't the most efficient way to optimize. So, so I tend to think that we may, language modeling may not be the, the, the end game. Um, whether we need to build in say syntax, again, I don't think we probably need to build in syntax, uh, but whether we need uh, other inductive biases and or other learning signals and, and which of the two is going to be more important or whether we need both, that I, I can't say at this point with certainty. Yuka hasn't, I think, spoken today, so she can be next, and then Ellie, and then we'll see if we have any time left. Hey, thanks. Yeah, I, my question, I think, is maybe for Alison and also uh, Raphael. It has to do with the role of um, of data. And this point, Alison, that you were just making about more and more sophisticated heuristics. So before you said that, you think that it is evident that these models can learn uh, syntax. But also something that we've seen, of course, is that when we add more and more data, that that 
improves. So I think like for me, like the question is sort of twofold. So I think for Raphael, the question would be, so if you're saying that scaling helps a lot, what do you think is actually happening there? And sort of the counterpart to Alison is like, if you give a lot more data and the heuristics get a lot more sophisticated to the point that like it looks like the model is behaving compositionally, would there be a point that you're like convinced about that? Or is there some implication that this needs to be learnable from a smaller amount of data? Like, is there any scenario in which you would be convinced that a model that's trained on a lot, a lot, a lot of data has actually picked that up? Do, do you want to start, Alisa? Feel free to go. I think you had the first counterpart of the question. <laughs> right. So yeah, I think that that's a that's a fantastic question, and I my my uh, intuition based on some of the the work I mentioned on mechanistic interpretability is that this has to do with the composition of attention heads uh, that uh, uh, induce uh, specific composition functions. So the work of Chris Ola and colleagues uh, have shown that when you go from uh, one attention layer to two attention layers already in these tiny toy models, you get these new kinds of attention head that they call induction heads that seem to uh, start implementing some complex algorithms uh, that can track uh, certain, certain uh, uh, properties of compositional structure. Uh, so by extension, you know, the, more, the more layers you have, the more you can have this complex interaction between attention heads that get specialized during training. And I think that goes a long way towards uh, even though this is still very impressionistic, towards explaining how these models can induce syntactic structure and, and eventually bridge the gap in compositional behavior between humans and machines. This is why I think we can't discount uh, the importance of scaling, even though that's not all we need. Yeah, and just to address the second part of the question, I, I think this is a fantastic question. I, um, I don't think that we, in, in sort of, we need to define what compositionality is. I think that that needs to be defined independent of how much data got us there, right? So if we scale models to a significant extent, we use tons of data and we end up with a model that is literally indistinguishable in its outputs from humans and we never find it tripping up and making mistakes that humans don't make, then absolutely, we can, we can be convinced. It's not, of course, it's less ideal than a more efficient uh, efficiently learned model, but I certainly would not say, oh, well, it's indistinguishable from a human, but because it wasn't learned quickly, it's not composition. I think those two things need to be separated. When we talk about heuristics and sort of, you know, the way that I'm thinking about this, what we're specifically focused on is to what extent do we think that the models have learned strategies for, for, for solving this task, which will lead to behaviors if we identify those heuristics and then break them, which will lead to behaviors that are clearly mistakes, clearly are, are, are not the behaviors that we want, clearly are deviating from what humans do, given that humans are extracting the meaning and then making decisions based on that meaning. So we need to be clear about how we define heuristics, because if one of our heuristics, if you, you know, one of the strategies that is just learn, you know, represent the meaning and then make a prediction based on it, that's not a heuristic, that's you know, actual human-like processing. So absolutely, you know, what we're looking for specifically is, are the models taking shortcuts that are non-human like that are going to result in uh, critical errors once we identify what those are and violate them. And Ellie has kindly yielded her time uh, to Duca uh, retroactively so that we could finish on time. Um, so thank you everybody. We actually did finish more or less on time, but reminder, same time, same channel tomorrow, we have five more speakers uh, talking about things like benchmarks and how we'd know where we are and if we were making progress and why all that's hard. Um, so I look forward to uh, day two and hope you will all come back then. Thank you very much for joining us.